Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Okay, welcome back to So to Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am, as always, your host, Nico Perino. And here in the D.C. metro area where I live and where I work, traffic has gotten bad again, so that can only mean one thing. Summer is over and school is back in session. And because school is back in session, I'd like to direct your attention to some schoolhouse-related items. The first is a free speech curriculum for teachers that my colleagues here at FIRE just recently put out. We have a number of lesson plans that teachers can use to enrich their existing instruction on the First Amendment and freedom of expression, we hope that that instruction is existing. Now, these lesson plans are geared towards middle school and high school classrooms, but if you're a college professor, I'm not going to stop you from using it. It works there as well. The lesson plans cover everything from the law to the philosophy of free speech, and we even have a special lesson plan for Constitution Day, which, reminder, reminder, is coming up on Tuesday, September 17th. So check those lesson plans out. I'll have a link in the show notes, and you can also find them at our website, thefire.org. And the other item I want to draw your attention to before we begin this show is our annual and very popular free speech essay contest, which is now open for submissions through the end of the year. We're taking submissions from juniors and seniors in U.S. high schools. We're also taking submissions from homeschooled students as well as citizens, U.S. citizens, attending schools overseas. We award $20,000. That is $20,000 in scholarship prizes to nine winners, We're giving $10,000 to the top essay writer. So if you're a junior or senior in high school, or you know a junior or senior in high school, we encourage you to check out the prompt. 700-word essay, just 700 words, could land you or a friend or a family member a $10,000 scholarship. Again, more info can be found at thefire.org or in our show notes. Now, let's get on to today's show. Our guest today is the conservative journalist Kevin Williamson. He is a roving correspondent for National Review, and he is the author of the new book, The Smallest Minority, Independent Thinking in the Age of Mob Politics. Now, you might recall that Kevin made headlines last year for his brief, very brief tenure as a reporter at The Atlantic, where he was fired only days after his first article appeared for the magazine. Now, I'm not going to get into what exactly happened to Kevin, the context of what happened to Kevin at the top of this show. I'm only going to say that if you want to learn more about it, You can check out a Wall Street Journal op-ed that he published last year that tells the whole story, or at least his side of the story. We talk about it a little bit here in this conversation because uh, it really informs a lot of what Kevin writes in the book. I mean, in some ways, his book, his new book, is an examination or a reflection upon what happened to him at the Atlantic insofar as it was a group of people, he calls them a mob or suggests they're a mob, that put together a campaign to get him fired from the Atlantic. Uh, now he says in the conversation, and I believe him that he started the book well before the Atlantic kerfuffle, uh, and that it was only after the kerfuffle that publishers became interested in publishing it. I don't know, but it's funny how that sort of thing sometimes happens. So on today's show, I talk with Kevin about his experience at the Atlantic a bit. We talk about the nature of mob politics. We talk about the nature of what happened to him and how it fits into kind of this conversation that the country is having about the power of a group of people to dictate what can or can't be said in the public square or what can or can't be said at our institutions of employment. We talk about what it means for free speech and inquiry and whether this is really a new phenomenon in American politics or just, you know, an old phenomenon manifesting itself in different ways. So now on to our conversation with Kevin Williamson. So, Kevin, thanks for coming on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So your book is largely about how mob-like behavior is increasingly dictating the scope of what can be expressed and and even who can be employed here in America. So I want to start with some examples for our listeners. What does the mob look like in modern America? Well, it's a combination of things, and it's slightly different in different situations. So we have your familiar kind of social media aggregation mob, um, usually on Twitter 
but sometimes on Facebook and other forms of social media. And these are things that sometimes form spontaneously, that sometimes are the product of invention and design by political groups and, and other groups that are dedicated to that purpose. We also have, and what I think is probably more significant to a lot of people, um, an internal version of that inside a lot of organizations. You see this at media outlets and companies like Google and Twitter and Facebook and the New York Times, in which you've both got the external pressure of the, the social media campaign, but that's really acting as a pretext or a supplement to internal pressure of people who are employees, staffers, and executives who have pl particular political or, or social ends that they want to bend the organization toward. So, you know, Dean Backhay, who's the editor of the New York Times, uh, mentioned this in a recent staff meeting where he said there's, you know, people on the outside and people on the inside who push the newspaper toward taking a more left-wing, more partisan democratic view of things. And sometimes these are really, really, very really focused. Like you've got one person who is um, targeted for thinking or saying something that is unpopular, or sometimes it's more of a, an organizational thing, like pressuring the New York Times to change a headline about President Trump or or something along those lines. So it's um it's something that goes across the the social and political spectrum, but um tends mostly to be a phenomenon that happens within the relatively small subpopulation of educated, uh, politically engaged people who are very active on social media. And because those people are socially influential, because they tend to be the people who are most involved in politics, cultural institutions, educational institutions, and news media, these phenomena have a larger um, scope and impact than they actually do. Well, mob behavior has kind of been present throughout American history, right? I mean, whether it's, the, yeah, whether it's the Tea Party movement, it could be the assassination of Elijah Lovejoy, the pro- and anti-union street fights of the early 20th century, civil rights protesters, moral majority, the list goes on. How is this era of mob behavior different than past eras of mob behavior, and is it more concerning than past eras? Well, no, I don't think so. There's always a tendency to tell ourselves that we live in the most significant times, the most yeah. extreme times. And ironically, that helps to foment that kind of mob behavior. But compared to what, say, John Brown was doing in the 19th century or what the Klan was doing in the 1930s, actual mobs actually lynching people and, and doing that sort of thing. What we have right now is pretty mild by comparison. Um, what it reminds me of is a combination of two things. Um, right around the time of the, the Red Scare, there was a sort of related movement um, that is that sometimes written about as the Lavender Menace, um, which was dedicated to the outing of gay men in professional positions, especially in government and universities and, and things like that. And that to me seems significant because it was a. Um, campaign that was based on discrediting people for something that was a purportedly disqualifying moral failing and the use of employment as the main weapon of political coercion, which is something we're seeing right now. The other thing it reminds me of, which is much less serious, I think, and in some ways humorous, is the um, panic in the 1980s over things like heavy metal music and rap music by yeah. people like Tipper, Tipper Gore and the PMRC. And the idea that if these naughty things that are said or sang or these naughty images are allowed to exist in public, that they will somehow cause these horrifying consequences of suicide and they will make drug addicts out of people who weren't drug addicts and they will make Satanists out of people who were Methodists the day before. And um, that was an interesting era to me because that was my my youth, and I was uh, you know a fan of punk music and heavy metal music during that time, and I and I remember the, the panic over it. And at the time, it seemed to me just psychologically transparent, and in retrospect, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> even more so, which was that this happened when the country was really at the crest 
of the great wave of divorces that began in the 1960s and crested in the 1970s, 1980s. And suddenly you had a lot of parents who were very concerned about the state of their children, the state of their family. And it's very difficult sometimes for people to admit their actual motivations for things or what the actual problem is. So on the one hand, we got this thing where Twisted Sister and Ozzy Osbourne were destroying the youth of America, not the fact that their parents and their families were defective. Now, on the other side, we got the much more serious but related phenomenon of the uh, satanic sexual ritual abuse cases in which people went to prison for a great long time for crimes that were never committed based on evidence that was made up by children and uh, therapists using now discredited and in fact then discredited techniques such as recovered memory and, and that sort of thing. So we have a related thing now with this kind of magical thinking um, that makes direct connections between things like if you are insufficiently supportive of, um, say, the agenda of trans rights organizations, then this constitutes an act of violence because trans people, for instance, have higher rates of suicide. Uh, they suffer from violent crime at higher rates, higher rates of addiction, things like that. So it's your speech isn't speech. Your speech is something that is causing these unhappy and undesirable social consequences. Of course, it's pure superstition, and it's made to repress, and it speaks to cultural rivalries and anxieties in much the same way as the, uh, the Ozzy Osbourne scare of the 1980s did. Well, what should we be encouraging people to do then? Because it's easy to, I guess, identify the problem. We don't want people getting fired for believing or expressing their innermost thoughts. Um, but for limited government folk, libertarian-leaning folk, uh, people who care about freedom, often we talk about how social sanction is kind of the release valve that we have when you don't mm -hmm. have the less desirable government sanction policing right. behavior. You know, so the question is, can we do without both or is there a certain level of so social sanction that's appropriate in a free society? And if so, how do you educate people about what that social sanction should be and the excesses of going too far? Because it's one thing to say that there's a problem. It's another thing entirely to tell people or educate people or discuss with people the proper ways to behave. Is it just as simple as don't try and get people fired from their jobs for believing something? You know? Yeah, well, some of this, you know, I mean, the problem with all this is you can never really develop a hard and fast rule. And you always have to end up relying on prudence and wisdom and the sense of proportionality and all the rest of it. So social sanction often is um, a very, very useful and desirable thing. I think most of us are glad there was such a thing as a Montgomery bus, bus boycott. Um, and this was an important chapter in the evolution of, of civil rights in America. I think a lot of us are glad that Mahatma Gandhi did his salt protest and uh, and other things like that. The fact that Charles Mary has been invited to deliver a lecture at Oberlin is not the same thing as uh, millions of Americans living disenfranchised and uh, unable to travel or own property or work because of their race. Um, these just are not related things. They're not proportional things. Uh, the fact that Milo Yiannopoulos might write a book somewhere is not apartheid. Um, we need a, a sense of, of proportion about those things and a sense of um, what is sensible. So do we want to live in a country in which if your congressman is walking in Castro and you simply make a donation to the political party that he is not in um, to its presidential candidate, that your local congressman is going to try to ruin you, your business, your family, financially, economically, things like that. I don't think that's um, a healthy place to be, but of course that means we have to rely on the wisdom and restraint and prudence of men such as Joaquin Castro, which of course you cannot because they are fools and self-interested and um, they know that people are easily scared and easily misled and easily buffaloed into doing whatever it is you want them to do, which is why they become politicians in the first place. So it's... Um, there's also things that we need to think about. You know, there were these kids... Um, well, not kids, they were adults, but young men who were at that horrible thing in uh, Charlottesville and, you know, carrying torches and uh, chanting and, and, and all that stuff. And they were, they have horrible political ideas. They're neo-Nazis. Um, but some of them were fired from jobs at fast food restaurants and things like that. Do we really want Mojo Burrito to be the world's police 
of what is acceptable political speech and isn't. And especially if we're talking about people on their own time. We're not talking about someone who had, who had done something at work. We're talking about people expressing opinions and political views, even horrible ones, on their own time and their capacity as private citizens. So is there such a thing as private life? And it's, it's very strange to me that progressives have taken the lead in this. They've always positioned themselves and presented themselves as the alternative to corporate power and the people who were there to keep a check on business interests. And now apparently the human resources departments of the Fortune 500 and Google and Facebook are to be the arbiters of what acceptable political speech is and isn't. And I don't think that's a very healthy place for a society to be. Yeah, the, the kind of two points based on what you just said. It, it gets down to essentially what your definition of what is good is. Uh, because presumably the people who were engaged in this mob-like behavior that you identify think that they're on the, the side of the good and the just mm-hmm. and the righteous. Uh, and they would argue that, for example, whether it's keeping you on at the Atlantic or uh, getting rid of Milo Yiannopoulos' book serves some sort of social justice end that is, is desirable. And in that sense, you could delineate mob-like behavior from community organizing, or maybe you can. Like, may, Is community organizing a type of mob-like behavior and you only call it a mob when you don't like the ends of the organizing? So that's one thought that's kind of hard to wrap your head around. The other is some of the community organizing that you identified there, whether it's Mahamas Gandhi or the, the bus boycotts, seem to be framed in this idea of common identity politics. Uh, my boss, Greg Lukianoff, and his co-author, Jonathan Haidt, kind of talk about the civil rights era as one in which civil rights leaders were saying that, you know, you are my brothers and sisters, and we want to be brought in within the fold of all that America has to offer, rather Mm -hmm. than how they frame it. Today's, I don't know, we can call it mob-like behavior, uh, community organizing, where it's framed around this idea of common enemy. You're an enemy, and therefore you must be purged from the society. And I think about this man named Daryl Davis, who uh, it's a black man lives right. I live in Washington D.C., right outside Washington D.C. in Maryland, who befriends members of the Ku Klux Klan. You may have heard about this as a way to try and give the, get them to give up their robes. And he doesn't get them to give up their robes by calling them names and trying to get them fired from their jobs or os- otherwise ostracizing them from society. He tries to get up their robes by demonstrating through his force of personality that their ideas are wrong. And he's been remarkably successful on that, but he's also taken flack from other organizers, whether it's Black Lives Matter or other groups, for that approach, because it is fundamentally a common identity approach. So you're seeing a sort of difference in activism between the older generation and then the newer generation. And where that began, I, I don't know. And I don't, I mean, I don't know. Do you know? Well, a couple of things that I will say about that. Um, I think a lot of this activism is different in fundamental ways from, say, the activism of the civil rights era or the Indian independence movement or other things like that that we've mentioned, in that a lot of it isn't really about politics exactly. It's not about people who are seeking particular policy goals, and particular outcomes. Um It's a sort of public group therapy session in which people engage in this ancient ritual of hating someone together. So you're right that it's more about common enemies than common identity. There are new sources of anxiety in life in the 20th century or 21st century, rather, for people. Um, People change employers more often than they used to. There's less stability in that sense. Americans move less often for work than they used to, but people at the top end of the educational and income spectrum move a lot um, more than they used to. And they sort of set the tone, I think, for uh, a lot of culture. Um, people get married later in life. They have children later in life. So a lot of the things that they, they, they go to church less. So a lot of the things that used to give people a sense of relationship and belonging, cohesion, status, and the rest of it have either been diminished or in many cases taken away from people entirely um, by certain social changes that are beyond their control. When people feel that these status hierarchies and and social relationships have been upended and that everything is up for renegotiation in terms of their social status, they get very, very anxious about this. And we've seen this at other periods in the past. 
and often the outcome are social trends like religious fanaticism or nationalism, things like that. In our time, we're seeing it um, partly, at least among a certain slice of the American population, in the substitution of this particularly silly, shallow form of partisan identity politics for everything else that used to give people a sense of meaning. So people now organize themselves and define themselves based not on who they are, but on who they hate. If you look at either the coalition that currently is the left, broadly speaking, or the coalition that is the right, broadly speaking, um, they are both now based on on hatred, on those people. Um, there are a lot of people who are on the right who disagree with each other basically about all sorts of important fundamental policy questions like capitalism, trade, individual rights, the law, those sorts of things. People on the left are the same way. There are people on the left who think of themselves as capitalists and people on the left who think of themselves as socialists. What papers over all this and gives them a sense of solidarity and cohesion is, well, those bastards over there, at least we're not them. Mm -hmm. And that normal team sports aspect of politics has now been elevated to the point that it excludes almost everything else. And that's because you see other institutions in society that would have otherwise bound people together diminishing. When I, when I think about that, I think, well, okay, what were some of these past institutions? You mentioned some of them, whether it's religion or, uh, the bowling league, uh, or even your country. I mean, the nationalism can be another one, patriotism, uh, uh, kind of coming together around American values. Uh, but those can also manifest themselves in undesirable ways. So all you have to do is look at the inquisition to see what religion can do, or you look at some, or the McCarthy era, era to see what, politics can do. And it's funny you say that some of this behavior comes from, I mean, I guess just in short, a sense of loneliness, yes. uh, but it's also, it's also coupled with the inability to de-individuate when you become a part of a group. I, I've talked about this on this show before about how I was one at one point, I'm not a protest guy, but there was at one point that I became a part of a protest. It was a large protest. And was really amped up about what I was protesting. And I get surrounded by all the other protesters, hundreds in this case, and I start chanting and doing and saying things that I would have never done were I not as in a, a part of that group. If, had mm -hmm. I thought about it by myself in my bedroom, you know, later that night, I would, what are you doing? And that's, and that's actually what happened. And I, I kind of told myself ever since that I'll never become a part of a protest before because I never want to get carried away in that way again, yeah. lose my sense of individuality. So it's that, that, but it was also very powerful and it gave me a sense of being a part of something. So there was that loneliness that made me become a part of you know, a protest is in a certain sense of mob like behavior. It doesn't always have to be bad, but yeah. become a part of the mob, but also the way the mob acts on the individual can have some consequences that maybe aren't desirable to the individual in other circumstances or from a different perspective. For a lot of people, divesting themselves of their individualism is a kind of liberation. Um, I write about this quite a bit in the book. Uh, you see this both in Eric Fromm, who's a Marxist uh, Freudian social critic, writing about the end of the Middle Ages and the emergence of the earliest forms of capitalism, but you also see it in... Um, Oh, what else did I have in mind there? Eric Fromm and who else was that? Well, churches do this as well. Well, I think Michael, Michael Okashot as well, who wrote about you know, people who experience individualism as a burden rather than as an opportunity. And in both cases, you see, um, I think these are in the end of the Middle Ages, obviously, is a much more radical social change than where we are now at the beginning of what we call globalization. But when the old peasant serf lord relationships got upset and were put up for renegotiation, People were better off in material terms. Life is getting materially better for people, but they were really upset by it because they were experiencing new kinds of anxiety. And I think that's what's happening to us right now with what we call globalization, is that people are experiencing new kinds of anxiety. So at the end of the Middle Ages, it manifested itself in the beginning of what became nationalism and also the Protestant Reformation and some kinds of religious fanaticism that were um, that leapt into being at that time. And we're seeing it less in the religious front right now, although we do see some of that and more on the um, on the political front, whether it's the newfound love of what they're now calling nationalism again on the right or socialism on the left. 
So I want to ask you about this phrase that you use in your book called ochlocracy, which is mm. essentially government by mob rule. And I wanted to ask, how is this distinguishable from democracy? Because ochlocracy and democracy, uh, neither of which re- require for their definition to be valid, the protection of individual rights. So what, I mean, does democracy have the imprimatur of like official government enshrined in constitution and ochlocracy is a little bit more amorphous or are they more or less the same thing? Well, they end up being very similar things. I think democracy is something that operates more under the color of the rule of law, whereas like yeah. ochlocracy is something that combines the rule of law through um, institutions, either of government or, you know, companies, private actors and things like that with either the threat of extrajudicial violence or, um, or other kinds of, uh, non-official forms of coercion. So the way ochlocracy typically works, and the reason I use that word instead of mob rule is that I want to distinguish it from lynch mobs and things like that and riots, which are mm-hmm. a, a phenomenon of their own. Ochlocracy, you know, going back to the Greek and Roman examples of it, and it was it was something that was on their minds very much too. Usually consists of the mob leaning on government or leaning on some other valid institution to do the mob's bidding for it. So this is, you know, we want Barabbas. This is, um, you know, the government must do this or else there will be riots. And um, in a sense, we've written that into our jurisprudence. This is my argument with Oliver Wendell Holmes. And the, you know, can't shout fire in a crowded theater thing, which is one of the dumbest and most useless cliches in American public life. Oh, yeah, of course. And people forget that this was a concoction that came up with uh, an argument for saying, yes, we can jail the leader of the Socialist Party for protesting World War I, for protesting conscription, because if we don't, then there will be civil unrest. So it's essentially making a constitutional principle out of the heckler's veto. The problem with that is that we're in a position right now where we've got probably the best First Amendment jurisprudence we've had in the history of our country. The First Amendment is in very good shape legally as far as the courts are concerned, but it's also a question of culture. And culture ultimately will inform how the law is interpreted and whether it's honored. So even though we're in a situation right now where we've got very, very good legal protections, people are not really more free to speak in many ways than they were, say, in the 1970s and 1980s or 1990s. It strikes me that there's there's two other maybe uh, minor differences between ochlocracy and democracy. I mean, democracy is often, although not necessarily, uh, needs to be understood as a majority, you know, fifty point oh oh one. It doesn't seem like that is a requirement for uh, ochlocracy. A, 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 you know, a mob can be a minority. Yeah, they often are. Because um, all you have to be is the loudest voice. And if everyone else is being quiet and they're at home watching The Bachelor or uh, looking at internet pornography or whatever it is people do with their days, um, then the relatively small group of people who care a lot about politics can dominate the conversation. And of course, that's the way it happens and the way it has happened for a long time. Uh, You don't become an op-ed writer at The New York Times or, in my case, a... um, reporter and columnist for National Review by accident. You don't you don't just casually fall into it. You know, it's a self-selecting group of people. Political organizations are by definition led by people who care a lot about politics, which means people who care about power in most cases. Mm-hmm. And um, it is relatively easy in a free society to um, to see your institutions dominated by relatively small groups of people. This is what I get into a little bit in the early part of the book with Carl Lowenstein, the idea of illiberal democracy, which is something that's um, much more common in Western Europe than it is in the United States, or militant democracy, as it's sometimes known. And this is the idea that the government of liberal democratic societies has a responsibility to sometimes behave in illiberal and undemocratic ways in order to protect the larger liberal democratic order. So this is the theory under which Germany and Austria prohibit certain kinds of political parties. They criminalize the possession of certain books. Um, there are certain kinds of speech that will get you actually thrown in prison there that we wouldn't normally uh, countenance, that sort of thing in the United States. But we're starting to adopt, I think, in some ways, a more European version of what a speech culture looks like and what the proper role for the state in policing speech is. And that's certainly the case on the left and on some parts of the right as well. And what Lowenstein was worried about, though, and he was right about this, is that um, 
illiberal and anti-democratic and totalitarian movements and factions, even if they're small, can exploit the natural weaknesses in liberal societies and democratic societies. They can exploit their openness and their um, their tolerance for their own ends. Uh, one of, I don't remember if it's actually Hitler who said this or someone writing about Hitler. I mentioned it in the book, but I'm now drawing a blank on it, that one of the great strengths of the totalitarian movements of the 20th century is that they forced their opponents to imitate them. And I think there's something to that. Well, it, it brings up uh, some of the ideas from the middle part of the 20th century from the Frankfurt School, thinking here about Herbert Marcuse and his repressive tolerance, the idea that in order to preserve an open society, a liberal order, he doesn't use the word open society, uh, but to preserve the liberal order, a tolerant society, you need to repress certain political ideas. He more or less calls for outright censorship. Um, yeah, he does. government censorship of of certain speakers in order to preserve this. And this is something that those of us who do First Amendment work, do free speech work, if we're talking about the culture at, at large, have been fighting against since then. Um, but it seems to have, you, you look at the debates between uh, David French, who used to work here at FIRE, and Sorab Amari, and it, that's more or less what Sorab is calling for, is this sort of He's calling for it almost in a theocratic sense, for, given his religious background. But the the targeting of certain perspectives and the use of government force to um, eliminate those perspectives, whether it's a dra drag queen story time or anything else, um, in order to preserve the sort of order that that he th thinks is necessary for a prosperous society. Yeah. Well, the good thing about Sorab, of course, is that he used to be a communist and then he was a libertarian and now he's an ultramontane Catholic. So whatever he ends up being next week will be their problem. <laughs> well, next week, I, th I think he's actually debating David here in D.C. I'm going to try and – Yeah, try David, and I, just, I just had coffee with David not 20 minutes ago, so it's a very small world. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that um, – well, you know, there's a lot of uh, grift in the political world and there's a lot of self-promotion. Mm -hmm. and a lot of career, careerism and that sort of thing. And I think that a lot of what this you know, so-called new nationalism is, is just um, people who want to have a career in political media who haven't managed to have one previously finding a new avenue to advance themselves. And uh, so we have a new version of conservatism in which the great enemy of our time is not the welfare state or communism or Islamic fundamentalism, but David French mm. and uh, the ghost <laughs> of Paul Ryan and that sort of thing. And um, it's a way of looking at the world that is really very difficult for me to take seriously and to think of with anything other than contempt. I would be remiss in the last 10 to 15 minutes that I have of you to not ask about the Atlantic situation. I don't know that we need to, <laughs> I know you hate talking about it. That's what you say in your book. I don't, I don't mind that much. It's, um, yeah, it's part of the story. Yeah, well, you know, the funny thing about the book is that I started writing it in 2015. Nobody wanted it until I got fired by the Atlantic a few years later. My phone rang and uh, I started getting offers for the book, which was <laughs> um, the Streisand effect in, uh, in practice. Well, you know, something I, I often point out about these situations is that, um, well, two things that need to be understood. One is that um, this culture of aggressive conformism and intellectual and political homogeneity is much less of a problem for someone like me who's professionally in the controversy business or David French or Brett Stevens or someone like that than it is for people who are not in politics and media, for people mm -hmm. who are, you know, manager of Starbucks in Philadelphia and wondering what they're going to lose their job for trying to enforce a company policy, or someone who's a programmer at Google who's worried he's going to get fired for having their own political views, or that the IRS is going to leak his uh, contribution to the National Organization for Marriage or something like that. Those are the people that really, you know, have to worry about this more than, than the rest of us do, I think. And um, that being the case, um, the situation in places like uh, the Atlantic for me was um, these things often are never are not about what they seem to be about. Um, no one at the Atlantic was surprised by my views about anything or any things I have said and written over the years. They know they're journalists. They look at the stuff before they hire you. They're, mm -hmm. they're familiar with they're familiar with who you are. And you had actually warned them. <laughs> that they're yeah, going to come after you. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, they'll start five minutes after you announce that you've hired me. If it even takes that long. And here's what they'll say. And yeah, this we all we all knew about this going forward. And um, 
So, you know, for someone like me, I get fired by the Atlantic. I write a column about it in the Wall Street Journal. Life goes on. Um, it's, it's a very, very different thing for, for other people. But what people don't understand, because we focus so much on the personalities involved in this, whether it's, you know, it's me or the campaign against Brett Stevens or the campaign against Sarah Jong or the campaign against uh, Barry Weiss or someone like that, is that it's not about us. It's about the institution. Mm -hmm. No one cares about getting some nobody fired from Google. They care about the fact that they can make Google do what they want it to do. No one cares about getting me fired from the Atlantic. There's no real political juice in that. If anything, you just made me better known and help me sell more books. But if you can say, look, we can make the Atlantic do what we want it to. We can make the New York Times write a headline the way we want it to. We can make ABC cancel a show. We can make CNN do this. Or we can make HBO do that. Um, that's real power. And that's power worth having because these institutions matter. And of course, the only way any of this is ever going to get sorted out properly is if these institutions begin standing up for themselves and taking their own independence seriously. Um, I do credit the New York Times on this, even though they've occasionally allowed themselves to be bullied around a little bit. You know, they didn't fire Brett Stevens. They didn't fire Barry Weiss. They didn't fire Sarah Jong. They more or less decided that we'll hire who we want to hire. And if you don't like it, well, there's a lot of newspapers for you to read, but we're the New York Times. We're going to manage our own newspaper. Yeah. So they're not jumping when people say to jump. And unfortunately, the Atlantic didn't have sufficient institutional reserve and resolve and self-respect to do that um, in my particular case. But, you know, people make mistakes. Well, there seems to be a sort of leadership vacuum. And I don't know why CEOs and other leaders haven't recognized that when you take a strong stand for a certain value, it seems to work as a bulwark against some of these campaigns against you. I see this, of course, in the campus context when Camille Paglia, yeah. there was the call for her to be fired at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia because of something she said on Spiked about the yeah. Me Too movement. The president of the university, without delay, issued a university-wide email saying, no, we don't fire academics for being academics, essentially. Yeah, that was kind of funny. I, I, I lived in Philadelphia for a long time. And um, of course, in any normal, decent, self-respecting society, Camille Paglia wouldn't be at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. She'd be at Harvard or Princeton or Yale. But none of those institutions are led by people who have um, the intellectual self-respect that this obscure textiles college in Philadelphia does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you saw at Yale with the Nicholas and Erica Christakis case, a very tepid response from the Yale leadership um, that let that controversy drag out longer than it otherwise should have. But you see it at University of Chicago where they've staked out a strong leadership position in favor of free speech and academic freedom. And they've been insulated from a lot of the conflagrations that you see elsewhere on campus. And this isn't to say that a university, a private university, at least not bound by the First Amendment, can't stake out a social justice mission sure. if it wants. Uh, it just needs to be honest about what its identity is so there isn't a mismatch of expectations. And th that's kind of leads into my next question, which is, what is the role of a writer from your perspective? And, and that might seem like a lame question, but if I'm an employer, no, no, no. if I'm if I'm the Atlantic, and one of the ways you ensure an employee is doing a good job is to clearly define that job for the employee, and the employee, of course, agrees to that job description. I, I have to put together job descriptions for all my employees, go over them with the employee, so that there's no mismatched expectation. Now, of course, there are different kinds of writers. There are straight news writers. There are people who write car manuals for a living. But for editorial writers like yourself, what does it mean to be doing your job? My, my thought always, I'm a big fan of Christopher Hitchens, has yeah. been to provoke, to provoke thought, different sort of thought, not necessarily preaching to the choir. Um, you know, the say whatever you would. One of the things about the Atlantic episode is that I was not hired there to write right-wing commentary. I was hired there to be a reporter. Um, I was hired there to write um, what the editor referred to as essentially Moynihan Report for white people. Uh -huh. um, you know, I spent a lot of time writing about poverty and addiction in uh, rural, largely southern and largely white communities. And that, I think, is probably the most useful work that I've done over time. And that's really what the Atlantic wanted me there to do. So um, it was funny when I was hired and that, um, you know, the subsequent debate over it, a lot of people... Um, framed it as though I were a candidate for political office. And so we would understand why you would hire Williamson in the first place. It's not like there's some Kevin Williamson school of conservatism. He doesn't have a constituency that he speaks for. And I thought to myself, well, thank God for that. You know, I never, yeah. never wanted one. I'm not running for office. But a lot of writers, particularly in politics and particularly um, other kinds of media figures, you know, cable news and such, uh, present themselves that way. They want to be a sort of tribune of the plebs. 
and to be leaders of a political movement or political faction. So, I mean, to take an extreme example, you've got people like Sean Hannity, who are essentially, you know, conducting a supplementary presidential campaign and uh, and frame themselves that way. You know, we're going to lead you to electoral victory. We are um, the party. We are the apparatus. We're the campaign. We're going to stop the Democrats. And that's, you know, that's not what I do. I'm not that kind of a political writer and certainly not a political leader. Um, you know, people often ask me about my relationship, you know, with the Republican Party. Um, conservatives ask me this all the time. What are you doing to make sure that Republicans get elected? And I have to explain to them, I'm not even a member of the Republican Party, much less, uh, much less a campaign advisor. And I don't do anything to try to get Republicans elected. That's, that's not my job. So I see my job as being someone who is um, a reporter and a social critic who tries to find out interesting things that are going on in the world and learn about them and explain them to people in a way that is useful in a self-governing liberal society full of people who may be curious about aspects of life that they don't have direct personal experience of. I don't see myself as an advocate for a party or an ideology or a philosophy, even though I've got beliefs and they're there to be seen in my work. And I don't make any secret of them, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, that's not really, I think, where I, where I create value. So, but we are increasingly treating journalists as though they were political candidates, including subjecting them to a kind of form of opposition research of saying, well, look, this guy, you know, when he was in college, he dated this girl and they had a bad breakup. And that was 30 years ago, but we think it's still really very relevant. And, you know, this guy got a drunk driving conviction and this happened to this. And uh, it's very different from how we used to treat writers. I was talking about this the other night on the Bill Maher show where, um, you know, Norman Mailer stabbed his wife in public yep. <laughs> and just about killed her. And, of course, this was adjudicated the way these things should be adjudicated, which is in court, um, although arguably he didn't get enough of a sentence for it. But would we be better off if people had shunned him after 1960 and none of his writing had been published and there'd been no executioner song? There'd been none of these things that we appreciate about his literary career. Uh, T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound were just horrible racists and anti-Semites. And Ezra Pound actually worked for the fascist government of Italy during the war. Would we be better off if their books weren't there, if their poems weren't there? I don't, I don't think so. Would we, be, would we be better off if we burned all the Picasso paintings? Because he was really rotten toward women. Um, I don't think that would make the world better off. Now, not to compare myself or <laughs> Milo Yiannopoulos or anyone else to any of these figures, but if you want to take a moralistic view toward these things and say, well, if you commit a certain kind of transgression, whether it's criminal or simply a, a violation of certain rules of etiquette, like our increasingly baroque pronoun rules and those sorts of things, uh, then you are to be excommunicated and your work must be uh, suppressed. I think we're going to leave ourselves with a very bland, vanilla, uninteresting and uninspiring culture. Well, we, we see a little bit of that on campus. You might recall a couple of years ago, there was the debates uh, surrounding a lot of the disinvitations of commencement speakers at campus. Mm -hmm. Now, campus commencement speeches are typically bland and boring, but every now and then a university will invite someone interesting to come. But they just don't do that anymore because most interesting people are people who have provoked or had life experiences uh, that are sometimes controversial. Uh, but yeah. inviting those people is really just not worth it anymore because it distracts all the you know, sort of cultural figures who just simply couldn't have a career today. Mel Brooks could not make any of his movies today. Mm -hmm. Iggy Pop could not be a public figure if he weren't already one. Uh, Aerosmith certainly couldn't be. You know. you know, well, it makes you, it makes you wonder about the sixties and seventies. Our celebrity icons were people who transgressed. Um, yeah. they were, they were the punk rockers. They were the, the metal heads, the guys with long, but yeah, it doesn't. It seems like transgression is no longer cool. I mean, if you if you even if you listen to our music culturally, it's you know Katy Perry talking about you know being a firework. <laughs> it's like this kind of you know, weird. I spent a lot of I spent a lot of time talking to these um, some of these Silicon Valley executives, and it's interesting that they're people. They don't typically have very highly developed political ideas, but they've got social ties, and they're West Coast California people, and they're easy to bully for that reason. But what's funny is they've always talked about um, disruption, you know, and disruption is the thing they care the most about. I once spoke at the Tribeca Film Festival at the Disruptors Conference, which I believe was um, sponsored by Google. And Google, in their marketing and their description of their business, really likes this word disruptors. And they just put out a memo to their employees um, about 
don't talk about politics and don't say things that might be controversial because these would be disruptive. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so the one thing that will actually, of course, get you fired from one of these disruption loving companies is disruption. Um, And that's partly because of the changing role of corporations socially. It's no longer just a source of income and making widgets. It's a source of meaning for people. And uh, we take our lives and our relationships with these institutions to be um, intertwined in ways that aren't merely economic. You know, working for Apple or Google or Facebook um, means something other than I produce this code and I get this paycheck. Oh, that's really interesting because that gets that sense of belonging. I mean, are we not just replacing our political identity with some of the previous identities we had, whether they were religious or what, um, with, you know, it's also the corporate, we're, the, we're part of, we want to feel a part of a corporate mission. And, and that might yeah. actually speak to the recent survey result where the majority of CEOs now say that maximizing shareholder profits is no longer the primary goal of corporations. It's, yeah. you know, being part of an activist mission. Um, mm-hmm. so they're not, they're shaping the institutions in certain ways, perhaps. Yeah. I think, um, the corporation and the employer, is now one of the main theaters where social life is lived and and where life in general is lived. It's no longer just um, I punch the clock, I turn a wrench, I get a check, I go home. It's, um, it's a much more complex and deep and entangling relationship than it was even 20 years ago. Yeah, you have to be even more careful about your social relationships in the workplace. You know, lest yeah. you... You know, and it's an enormous, it's an enormous provider of status, and not only status in the sense that I'm affiliated with something important, but also it's access to things that maybe you wouldn't get to do or see or experience as a uh, person who wasn't affiliated with that. So even you know, as a journalist, you get to do things that people who aren't journalists don't get to do unless they are people who are rich and famous or celebrities mm-hmm. or things like that. And I think that's probably true of you know working for Silicon Valley companies. It's true of working for certain Wall Street firms. It's true of different kinds of uh, corporate life, and I think that is part of what gets people spiritually entangled in their employment in a way that they weren't a generation or two ago. Well, there's a lot we could continue to talk about here, the distinction between the art and the artist, um, the idea of redemption. Um, yeah. there That seems to be lacking in a lot of these conversations. There's Say what you want about Christianity, I am not religious, uh, mm-hmm. but there is this concept of that people can be redeemed, uh, that's a little bit lost. If I could just maybe say this in closing, one of the great ironies of this is that um, this largely secular uh, culture on the, on the progressive side of the fence has essentially reinvented the Catholic teaching of scandal. And if these things are allowed to stand, that is a social harm in and of itself. And that's what we're really talking about here is mm-hmm. that the left has developed a secular version of the old Catholic sin of scandal. Yeah. Well, Kevin, this has been, this has been fascinating. I guess just as cl- in closing here, do you ever think you'll get back on social media? I don't see any reason to, um, Brett Stevens just got it, off, I guess. It's, it's, oh, he'll be back. Um, <laughs> I don't enjoy it. I don't find it useful. Uh, I don't make any money from it and I don't sell any books that way. And, um, you know, it's, uh, occasionally you end up at two o'clock in the morning, beating up some uh, undergraduate at Lehigh University and telling me he needs to read Hayek. And I just don't think that's a very good investment of my time typically. So if I had it my way, I wouldn't even do a lot of daily journalism. I would just write books and maybe three or four essays a year. But um, that is not the current economics of a media life. No, it is not. It's hard to disconnect. Well, Kevin, thanks again for coming on the show and hope to talk to you again sometime soon. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. That was National Review journalist Kevin Williamson. His new book, The Smallest Minority, Independent Thinking in the Age of Mob Politics, can be found wherever fine books are sold. If you're looking to hear even more from Kevin, I recommend checking out his podcast with National Review online editor Charles C.W. Cook. That podcast is called Mad Dogs and Englishmen. This podcast, however, was hosted, produced, and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by my colleague Aaron Reese. You can learn more about So To Speak by following us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk or liking us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also learn more by subscribing to our email list. The form to subscribe to the email list can be found at the top of our website, so to speak podcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. Reviews help us attract new listeners to the show. You can also email us feedback at so to speak 
at thefire.org. And until next time, thanks again for listening.